It's really a privilege and a challenge for me to be here among you. I've so much enjoyed hearing um, the messages in English, um, and uh, that's been a real joy to me since I do not know Russian. And uh, this has uh, been uh, particularly impactful uh, for me. My topic is justification by faith. In the book of Galatians, Paul presents the true gospel as justification by faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross, which satisfies the requirement of God for a holy blood sacrifice for the sin of mankind. Until a person comes to understand and put his complete trust in this truth, a man's works, no matter how righteous they may look, in the eyes of fellow man, are in God's eyes only filthy rags. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Truly, good works can only follow justification by faith. Never precede it and never add to it. it. In his letter to the Galatian church, Paul contrasts this true gospel with a false idea that certain people had brought into the church that justification by God could be achieved through keeping the Mosaic law. Paul's purpose in writing the letter to the Galatians is stated in chapter 2, verse 5 that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. In other words, the gospel must be cherished and clung to throughout life. And he finishes the letter with the result of the gospel in their lives, that love service replaces law bondage. And the liberty of the spirit replaces bondage to the flesh. Justification is also a prominent theme in the book of Romans and is mentioned in Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4, the just shall live by faith. Why is justification by faith so important? Because it results in our salvation. How are we saved? What does God expect of us? To quote Martin Luther, this is the chief article of the whole Christian doctrine, which comprehends the understanding of all godliness. If this article stands, the church stands. If it falls, the church falls. It's also been said that justification provides the foundation for the bridge that reconciles God and man. While Christians might say they believe in justification by faith, they often do not agree about what that statement means. Throughout the history of Christianity, whole groups of Christians have been killed over disagreements about what justification by faith means. My goal today is to explore the theological differences through history through the history of thought regarding justification by faith. This history will explain the different Christian denominations that exist in America today and how our Russian Baptist denomination fits into this American Christian framework. The core verses for my message are given here, Galatians 216 a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. But then in the book of James, and I recently learned that James was the very first book written 
uh, in the New Testament. It says, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. So what is meant by the word justification? What is faith and what are works? In the process of talking about these words, we need to become familiar with several more words, um, all related to salvation. One main goal of this English-speaking camp is for you to become familiar with Bible words in English. So I've prepared a handout, um, which is on, was on all of your chairs, with the words I will use that are related to salvation as well as a few theological terms. It has the word in English, Russian, and Greek, together with a definition from Vine's Expository Dictionary of Biblical Words, and a scripture passage where that word is used. Justification is the act of pronouncing righteous. It is a legal term with the same Greek root as the word righteousness. It's interpreted in different ways by different Christian groups. Is it a complete single declaration by God imputing Christ's righteousness on the believer at one point in time? Like a judge stating that an accused criminal is free and absolved of any crime. Or is it a process like a criminal who has served his sentence but must follow probation guidelines to remain free? What about faith? Faith is a means of justification, but is faith then a one-time act or a lifelong journey? And what does faith entail? It's not just understanding or even belief. Because understanding is different from belief in that understanding of a statement or idea does not, where am I? Oops, did it go? Okay. Um, Does not admit to the truth of that statement. So you can understand something, but it doesn't mean that you believe it's true. Belief admits that the idea is true, if you believe something. But belief is not the same as faith, because one can give intellectual assent to something, that the idea is true, uh, but faith also includes trust in the idea. It says in James, even the demons believe and tremble. Before going much farther, it's necessary to make sure we all know what this faith is that we're talking about. According to the statement of faith of our brotherhood, God sent into the world his only begotten son in human flesh that by his blood shed on Golgotha's cross, he accomplished the redemption That is, he paid the price for all the people. Jesus Christ satisfied the demand of God's holiness, and now salvation by grace is available to all people. So is faith just a one-time act or a living faith? James 2.24 which I showed earlier, would suggest that the faith that leads to justification is an ongoing life, demonstrating trust in Jesus that results in righteous works. The just shall live by faith. But these works then, are they an additional means of justification? Another term we must consider is grace. This important word has always eluded me a little, but it definitely has a crucial role in justification and salvation. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, 
not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Here it seems that grace is the source from God, faith is the means, and salvation and works are the result. To better understand this and the important differences in interpretation of these passages, it's helpful to look at a brief history of the Christian church. Oops, what did I do here? Okay. After Christ's death, the apostles carried on the teachings of Jesus. Once they died, their disciples continued the process despite extreme persecution from the Roman Empire. For 300 years, the church grew despite brutal persecution with Christians being tortured and killed. Then Constantine, when preparing for a great battle, saw in the sky a cross and the words, in this sign you will have victory. Constantine won the battle and became the emperor of the Roman Empire. In 313 AD, he declared that Christians were not to be persecuted, and in effect, he made Christianity the state religion. Instead of persecution, Christians now enjoyed protection, honor, power, and pastors who once were burned or eaten by lions now received a salary. The church grew quickly, but now it was filled with many who, who merely declared a belief in Christian doctrines for obvious benefits, but were not true Christians. And so we might ask the question, who is a true Christian? During the time of persecution, before 300 AD, the fire of persecution kept the church pure, and the question of whether a convert was a true Christian was not an issue. Constantine made Christianity the state religion, and now it was not clear who actually had a saving faith in Christ. During the next 1,000 years, the purity of the church greatly declined. There were times when the Pope of the Catholic Church the only organized official church, would dictate how the political state should act. While at other times, it was the state that ordered how the church should act. During this time, the purity of the established church suffered as ever more power was granted to the Pope. And in 461 AD, the Pope was declared infallible. His pronouncements and the decrees of church councils were as authoritative as scripture. The lay people were often excluded from theological understanding because there was no Bible in the language of the common people. All interpretations were controlled by the church clergy and communicated indirectly to the people so that there was a strong distinction between clergy and laity. The veneration of the saints and the adoration of Mary as the means to reach Christ gained prominence with worship becoming an ornate ritual. Relics, such as the supposed bone fragments of Peter or wood from the cross of Christ, were revered and magical powers were ascribed to them and used to control the masses and to raise money for the Crusades. Expensive building projects and extravagant lifestyle, um, such as garments and lodging uh, for the high religious leaders, were common for many clergy. Although the church belief was that sinners were justified by faith, the faith was a process and include required participation in the seven sacraments, baptism, confirmation, communion, that would be the Lord's Supper, penance, anointing of the sick, 
marriage, and holy orders. Doing penance for forgiveness and sins for, uh, and, uh, for, for sins and pilgrimages to shrines also added to your um, 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 righteousness. Perhaps foremost of these church abuses was the notion that purgatory was a place where dead sinners paid for their sins before admission into heaven. The Pope claimed the authority to release men from purgatory. He also endorsed the sale of indulgences, which were documents authorizing sinners in purgatory to go to heaven. The money so obtained would be used to fund church building projects and other church related excesses. And this is most important. In all of this, it was the church that controlled the keys to justification and salvation of the sinner. To be sure, there were some who recognized the excesses of the Roman Catholic Church and attempted to reform it. Peter Waldo, in 1170 AD, spoke out against many of these abuses. He rejected some of the sacraments, purgatory, and infant baptism. He rejected the authority of the Pope and the decisions of the church councils, but rather based his doctrine solely on the Bible. He and his followers, the Waldensians, were excommunicated from the church and vigorously persecuted and killed. John Wycliffe, an English scholar around 1360, translated the Latin Bible into the English language so that all could read and interpret it themselves. He offered many reforms that would reappear 200 years later in the Protestant Reformation. His followers were called Lollards and offered a plan of salvation not through the church but found through the cross of Christ. The Catholic Church, however, had so much power that it persecuted those who disagreed with its creeds and edicts. Instead of being persecuted, the church was now the persecutor. The Lollards were hunted and killed. The Bohemian Jan Hus around 1400 AD, also recognized the errors in the Catholic Church. Hus read Wycliffe's books and agreed with him that the Pope should have no religious authority, that only scripture should be followed, and he preached only in the common Czech language. He said that clergy and laity were equal, and one did not have to approach Christ nor gain salvation through the church. The sacraments were not required for salvation. He was offered written protection from Rome and a safe passage in order to defend his views. But upon arrival, he was arrested and burned at the stake as a heretic because the church claimed it did not have to honor any pledge of safety made to a heretic. Huss's followers formed the Moravian Brethren Church, which was the first Protestant church and predated the Protestant Reformation by 50 years. Though Huss had been dead for 100 years, Luther read his books in 1507 and later included many of his beliefs in his reforms. And now for the man we've heard a lot about already. In 1517, the Augustinian monk, Martin Luther, became enraged at the sale of indulgences and nailed his famous 95 essays on the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany. The printing press had been invented in 1440, so by 1500, it was available throughout much of Europe. Luther's essays were soon published and disseminated, causing considerable response and excitement. 
1520, Luther published a pamphlet called On Good Works, which responded to others who thought his claim of justification by faith alone could cause corrupt living. Luther wrote, truly good works are not self-elected works of monastic or any other holiness, but such only as God has commanded and as are comprehended within the bounds of one's particular calling. And all works, let their name be what it may, become good only when they flow from faith, the first, greatest, and noblest of good works. He followed by writing, I really like this, faith alone justifies, but faith is never alone. It is followed by works. In short, works of love are the goal of the saving faith. Like Wycliffe and Huss, he said every believer had access directly to Jesus. He translated the Bible from the original Greek and Hebrew into the German language so that the common people could understand it. For these actions, he was excommunicated and declared a heretic which was a death sentence at that time. But German princes kidnapped him and kept him safe in hiding for eight months. He stated that there are only two sacraments indicated in scripture, baptism and communion. And he believed that partaking in these sacraments was not required for salvation. He also said that celibacy was not a requirement for priests and then he married a former nun. <laughs> it was in this context that Luther made the famous statement given at the beginning of my talk that justification by faith is the chief article of the whole Christian doctrine. While he was a monk in the Catholic Church, he never thought of himself as good enough for God. He saw Jesus as cruel and wrathful, causing fear and anxiety. He saw fellow monks who had thought of themselves as a class above the common people because of their vows of moral purity and poverty. He saw them die in terror in the thought of meeting God, feeling that they had not done enough to please a holy God. Luther himself had no peace. After God revealed to him the truth of justification by faith, he saw the love of Christ and gloried in his special prayer time with Jesus. Luther realized that Jesus' righteousness could become the sinner's righteousness, and that could happen through faith alone in Jesus. Luther wrote many hymns, including A Mighty Fortress Is Our God, and I hope we will sing that sometime, um, today. How many of you have ever sung A Mighty Fortress is Our God? Yeah, yeah, not too many, not too many. Um, I don't really understand why that's not sung in the Russian church. It is in the hymnal, the Russian hymnal, it's number 229, and it's the main, um, um, well, the main hymn that was sung uh, during the time of the Protestant Reformation, and it was written by Martin Luther. He also wrote Away in a Manger. I know many of you have, have uh, sung that. He encouraged congregations to sing the hymns during worship. The congregations will sing it instead of a special choir that the uh, Catholic Church had uh, implemented. Um, and, often play, and Luther often played a lute to accompany the singing. Although Luther had only intended to correct the errors and excesses of the Catholic Church, it soon became apparent that a completely new denomination, Lutheranism, was needed. So this was the start of the Protestant Reformation. Zwingli in Switzerland, Calvin in France, Knox in Scotland, built upon Luther's lead with their own 
modifications. The denominations multiplied as disagreements in doctrine grew up within each Protestant group. Over the next 500 years up to the present time, as many as, some have claimed that as many as 22,000 Christian denominations have arisen. Though most differ in only minor points from each other, in general, these tended to endorse state religion, militarism, and justification by faith alone as a declaration by God upon profession of faith, rather than the Catholic belief that justification is an ongoing act intertwined with what Protestants would call sanctification. They did not see the distinction between justification and sanctification. The reformers tended to practice infant baptism and because of their Calvinist type of belief, they reasoned that if God chose his elect, he would never unchoose them. Believers, therefore, have assurance of salvation from the time they are declared justified as a result of their faith. Our typical American Baptists differ mainly in that they believe in adult baptism upon profession of faith, which they consider a distinctive rather than a verity. So American Baptists, in general, are still considered a product of the Protestant Reformation. The Reformation opened up other more distinct faith-based religious communities. One was called the Anabaptists. Anna means again. So Anabaptist means they were baptized again. Because they had been baptized as infants um, by their parents whenever, and again as professing believers. The goal of these churches was to base doctrine not on the views of the reformers, but to what they actually believed scripture taught. The Anabaptists were persecuted not only by the Catholic Church, but also by the Reformers. Not only did they refute infant baptism, they also favored non-resistance, separation of church and state, and a different interpretation of justification by faith. In their own words, I wanted to quote them because I wanted to make sure I didn't mess anything up. When Anabaptists, who would later become Mennonites, uh, which you've probably heard of as more as Mennonites rather than Anabaptists, use justification terminology, they were usually referring to the major dispute between Roman Catholics and Protestants that began in the Reformation. To the question of how a man or woman can be considered righteous by God and thus be freed from fear of condemnation, Catholics argued that justification is a comprehensive act in which God not only declares persons to be righteous, but also makes them so. Justification then cannot be sharply distinguished from the process of sanctification, according to the Catholics. To Catholics, sanctification occurs as humans cooperate with divine grace, and that grace is imparted largely through the sacraments and other church channels. Protestants countered that in order to truly begin sanctification, individuals must first be justified, a one-time act. For unless they are first freed from fear of condemnation, simply by faith in Christ's atonement on the cross, individuals can never perform those selfless acts of love which produce true sanctification. In contrast, this is what the Anabaptists would say. The Anabaptists approach the issues involved from a different angle. Like Protestants, they emphasize that God initiates the salvation process and that individuals enter it through faith. 
Yet they often complain that Protestants, by emphasizing faith alone, minimized sanctification in the salvation process. And this encouraged sub-Christian behavior. Like, like Catholics, Anabaptists insisted that sanctification, or actually becoming righteous, is the goal of God's saving work. Yet they argued that this occurs not within Catholicism's church framework of sacraments, but primarily through acts of love in daily life. And although human cooperation is involved in the process, most Anabaptists maintain that those works of love in, that are involved are not the work of man, but of God in Christ, working in the people through whose power a man does such works. It turned out that these Anabaptist ideas are very similar to the views of the early church fathers, those who had experienced the persecutions before 312 AD, before Constantine became emperor. Although the writings of these very early Christians are not inspired, they give the thoughts of Christians who were closest in time to the actual apostles. For example, Clement of Rome was a disciple of Paul and Peter. Paul mentions him in Philippians 4, uh, verse 3. He's one of the church fathers, and we have many writings from him. Polycarp was a disciple of the apostle John and the bishop of the church in Smyrna. And Smyrna is a church that's mentioned um, in positive terms in Revelations 2. So Clement said, we are justified by that faith through which from the beginning, Almighty God has justified all men. Which is what we've come to um, understand in general. But also he said, for what reason was our father Abraham blessed? Was it not because he worked righteousness and truth through faith? Polycarp wrote, he who raised him up from the dead will also raise us up. If we do his will and walk in his commandments and love what he loved, keeping ourselves from all unrighteousness. So the church fathers clearly stated that faith is absolutely essential for salvation and that without God's grace, nobody can be saved. But they also believe that works or obedience play an essential role in our salvation. Were they confused? It kind of confuses me. Today we tend to think that either we are saved by grace or our salvation is conditioned by obedience and works. The early Christians believe that salvation is a gift from God and that he gives that gift to whomever he chooses and he chooses to give it to those who love and obey him. If a gift is conditioned on obedience, it's still a gift. So how does this relate to our present times? Our brotherhood grew out of the Russian Baptist mold, which was linked to Mennonite settlers in Russia. In 1867, German Mennonites in Ukraine and Lutherans in the Baltic coast started a revival named the Stundist Revival, which led to the formation of churches composed of adult baptized believers. Vasily Pashkov and the British nobleman, Lord Radstock, introduced the evangelical message to the upper classes in St. Petersburg, adhering to the principles of the Plymouth Brethren, and later um, would emerge the church as the union of evangelical Christians in Russia. Many of the ideas of our Baptist Brotherhood are similar to those of the Anabaptist Mennonites. For example, non-resistance, separation of church and state, believer's baptism, and in particular, the approach to justification by faith is similar, I think, to classic Anabaptist thought in that 
Faith induces a man to trust the Lord and to be obedient to him. The confession of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is confirmation of true faith. The evidences of true faith are the works of faith. Concerning assurance of salvation, man who comes to believe and is revived will reach eternal life only in that case if the beginning of life in Christ is firmly preserved that is kept to the end. So one who rejects his faith in Christ will lose his salvation. Let's look at um, how all this plays out in our current American churches and how the brotherhood fits into that landscape. The American Reformed churches, such as Presbyterian, Congregationalist, and Calvinist denominations, differ greatly from our Baptist beliefs. Infant baptism, predestination, salvation of the elect, and amillennialism are a few of the differences. Justification by faith is a one-time event where God declares the believer to have the righteousness of Christ. The believer, therefore, cannot lose his salvation. It's more difficult to generalize the American Baptist groups. Most were derived in the 1600s from Puritan Reformed Calvinist thinking, but differed from Puritan and Anglican beliefs in that only believers are baptized. Most are Arminian. And what does that mean? It means that they believe that the gracious gift of saving faith that God offers to all people can be rejected in opposition to what the Calvinists would believe. Like the Reformed churches, they believe that justification by faith is a one-time event where God declares the believer to have the righteousness of Christ. The believer, therefore, cannot lose his salvation. Furthermore, they believe in righteous war and use of force. Free will Baptists, there aren't too many of them, but they are around, have belief closer to ours Free will Baptist doctrine holds to the traditional Arminian position that God offers grace for salvation uh, and that offer can be rejected. They also believe it is possible to commit apostasy or willfully reject one's faith. And since faith is the condition for salvation, free will Baptists hold to only conditional eternal security. Man can lose salvation by willfully rejecting Christ. Methodists are also Arminian because they believe God's work in us consisted of what they call prevenient grace, which undoes the effects of original sin sufficiently that a man may then freely choose to believe. An individual's act of faith then results in becoming part of the body of Christ. Um, however, once the individual has been justified, one must then continue in the new life. And if one fails to persevere in the faith and falls away um, from God in total unbelief, then he may be lost. John MacArthur, representative of most Baptist and non-denominational conservative views, says, in biblical terms, upon the believer's declaration of faith in Christ, Justification is a divine verdict of not guilty, fully righteous. It is the reversal of God's attitude toward the sinner. Whereas he formerly condemned, he now vindicates. Although the sinner once lived under God's wrath, as a believer, he or she is now under God's blessing. Believers not only are perfectly free from any charge of guilt, but also have the full merit of Christ imputed to their personal account. Justification is therefore a one-time occurrence through faith as God declares the sinner is righteous. It follows that the believer is then assured of salvation for the rest of life. Here's a um, little chart that I found helpful which traces how the different denominations split off from each other and where they, where they split off. Um, at the top is the um, Catholic, the Western Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox split. 
Um, and then you've got the, um, the Protestant Reformation coming off of the Catholic and the Anabaptists coming off from the Lutherans, whereas the Baptists, the American type Baptists, come off from the Calvinist line. Here's a little chart that I pulled together, which uh, kind of shows some of the key, um, uh, key ideas, uh, that uh, key doctrines of the different uh, churches that you have probably run across, your friends or members of, in the, uh, in the United States. But what is faith? American churches often claim, once saved, always saved. If you walk the aisle, as they would say, repent and ask God to save you, then you are automatically a Christian, and most claim you cannot lose your salvation. God will justify you and cover all of your sins, past, present, and future. The danger is that this can lead to belief that you are able to do anything without losing salvation. This is called cheap grace by Bonhoeffer or easy believism by MacArthur. Paul Washer also laments this among modern evangelicals as he saw many youth denounce their faith. I thought this was an interesting um, graph that shows for the Southern Baptist Convention, which is the um, largest denomination of Baptists in the United States, that shows uh, from children that are, from young people that are 16 years old on the left side, what they are doing 10 years later on the right side. Shows that the denomination is decreasing in total number but the most scary thing is that lower right that I've circled there in red, which says that, well, it looks like maybe at least 10% of the youth have no religion now. And that's what scared uh, Washer and MacArthur and others. To counter this trend, MacArthur pro promoted what he called lordship salvation that requires that for true justification, a believer's faith must be genuine. For this, MacArthur has been strongly criticized by evangelicals as being dangerously close to Catholic teaching. Uh, you can see there that the uh, genuine faith uh, on the left side uh, involves such things as love their brothers, obey God's commands, do the will of God, abide in God's word, do good works and continue in the faith. Um, on the right side, I happen to look in our, again, the Brotherhood Statement of Faith, and they ascribe very similar um, attitudes. However, what they, instead of calling them um, indicators of genuine faith, they say this is indicators of regeneration, uh, of a new birth. Uh, that's there. Okay, I'll close with uh, two warnings. Seems like Satan is always trying to knock a true believer off balance. The two extremes related to justification by faith are that easy believism that I've already mentioned, where you have a casual acceptance or mental assent to the gospel perhaps to satisfy your parents' wishes, or to remain active in youth group social gatherings. The other extreme, though, um, is to be continually worried if you are doing enough. Is God pleased with your activities? Could you reject Christ in the future? Was my faith genuine? This is how Satan tormented Martin Luther before his revelation of the true meaning of justification by faith. By the way, this last um, issue there, um, you will find also in the Reformed churches. You might think that if they have assurance of salvation, then they would not have to worry about that. But I can assure you that it's just as prevalent there. <clears throat> 
Um, easy believism is certainly there. I, was, uh, I grew up as a Presbyterian, Reformed, Calvinist. And at 13 years old, I took the class with the rest of my other 13-year-old friends. We said, yep, we believe it. And after that, I went my own way and uh, didn't come back to Christ until about 20 years later. Um, on the other hand, you might think that they wouldn't have to worry about, um, you know, am I doing things right? Uh, am I doing enough? Because they have assurance of salvation. But they're always wondering, did God really choose me? And the same sort of issues come up. The solution was something that Hudson Taylor discovered. Hudson Taylor was, uh, he started the China Inland Mission, a great missionary of the 1800s. For years, he was struggling with himself about, am I doing enough? And finally, he realized, all I need to do is to rest in Jesus. And I noticed the song that we sang earlier said, um, to just rest on Jesus' promises. Okay, that's, that's basically what I have here, but I, I want to make a confession. I wrestled with God a lot last night. Um, it was hard for me to sleep. And... What I came to is that a lot of what I've been telling you is rubbish. Um, it's men's philosophy. And um, when I came here this morning and David said, we need to listen with a receptive heart. I said, okay, Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready. And then Tim said, you know, he, he talked about the beauty and the simplicity of the gospel. And then Bogdan came back with, what are the dangers of perverting the gospel? And it was like a one-two punch in my gut. Um, here, you know, I've been talking about well, 22,000 denominations. What, what, what would... What would Jesus, what would God think about that? Let's look, let's look at 1 Corinthians, I think. 1 Corinthians 1, 11 to 13. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas or I am of Christ, or I am of Calvin, or I am of Luther. Um, I am of um, Wesley. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Tim mentioned, don't conform the gospel to fit into our mold. And yet, it seems like throughout 1,500 years, that's been going on. Otherwise, it wouldn't come up with so many differences about justification by faith, about the gospel, about who can we get along with. Bogdan mentioned uh, a distorted gospel brings terrible results. Well, again, over 2,000 years, a distorted gospel has resulted in hatred rather than love. Somewhere here, probably, there's someone wondering about Christianity. And that this is what I really need to ask your forgiveness for. You're thinking, excuse me, do you expect me to believe 
something and put trust in it that people have been arguing about for 1,500 years, not just arguing, but fighting about for 1,500 years? You might be sitting there and saying, there's no way I'm going to be involved with that. And for you, I ask that you would forgive me for going through this and, and pointing out all the differences that we have. It's really not that hard. And I think I'll just end oops, with um, Colossians 2, verses 13 and 14. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, the legal documents, if you like, that were against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So I apologize. I ask your forgiveness that the gospel of Christ is far more precious and beautiful than a review of the history of denominations would ever indicate. Amen.